Playland is an interesting amusement park in Vancouver, Canada. This park is owned and operated by the Pacific National Exhibition, or p and &E, and it's a key part of the annual p and &E Fair. This is the time of year that most people experience Playland. But is it the best time to visit this park? I will answer that in this review. The Vancouver Exhibition Association was founded back in 1907. They wouldn't get their current name of the Pacific National Exhibition until 1946. They held their first fair in 1910 at Hastings Park and has since become an annual tradition. From day one, the fair included some amusement rides. These were so popular that a permanent amusement park opened on the grounds in 1929 named Happy Land. This park was closed in 1957, and just one year later, the p &E opened a new amusement park in 1958 named Playland. The park opened with Canada's largest wooden roller coaster at the time, and today, Coaster is still the park's signature attraction. And this park gets a lot of media coverage because Vancouver is a popular filming location for films and TV shows. Playland's most famous media appearance was in 2006 Final Destination 3, when the former corkscrew roller coaster had a lethal and highly unrealistic accident. It also made a few appearances in CW's Arrowverse, most prominently on The Flash. Playland feels very much like a permanent carnival, and a lot of that is attributed to its small size. The park is very compact, covering just 15 acres. It's a small part of Hastings Park, which covers 150 acres. Roughly two-thirds of that land is occupied by the p &E, who use it for the expo halls and facilities. While the immediate area around Hastings Park is not too flashy, the park is a spectacular backdrop. You have a mix of city skyscrapers and mountains in the distance. This is especially fantastic from the park's tallest rides. Your arrival experience will vary mightily depending upon the time of year. If you visit during the p and &E Fair, expect more traffic and higher parking rates. Do not be surprised if you have to pay $20 to $25 near the fairgrounds to park. The p and &E themselves thankfully have plenty of parking available. If you visit Playland outside of these seasons, you'll still have to pay for parking, but not nearly as much. If you're coming from the United States or overseas, no need to get Canadian dollars. The main lot takes credit cards, as does all the ticket booths and food stands inside the park. You may need cash if you park at an independent lot though. I believe you can find some cheaper and possibly free parking in the nearby residential neighborhoods, but I just don't know the area's parking rules well enough to take advantage of this. Alternatively, you can reach the park by bus. There's a station just outside the park's main gate, the main entrance is fairly basic, but I do like how it looks. You have the park's name atop the turnstiles in giant letters. Then in the distance, you'll see the park's taller ride cycling and those aforementioned mountains. It is quite the skyline. Playland requires all guests to purchase a ride pass. There are two to choose from. The fun pass costs $35 to $40. This includes all the kiddie rides and the gentler attractions. The Thrill Pass includes everything on the Fun Pass, plus the park's Thrill Rides. This will cost $45 to $50 per person. The p and &E Fair runs from mid-August until early September. If you visit during this time of year, you will also have an additional $20 fee just to enter the fairgrounds, in addition to what Playland charges, but you do have some additional attractions at least. This includes some temporary flat rides at Playland just for the event. But then you also have all sorts of food stands, various shows, and those aforementioned expo halls. But if you visit during the fair, expect very heavy crowds. This 15-day event has drawn 600,000 to 700,000 people in recent years. While not everyone will go on the rides, Playland will be much busier than usual. I visited the 2019 p and &E Fair, and it was a madhouse. While the smaller rides were walk-ons, the largest thrill rides were absolutely mobbed. Queue lines exceeded an hour for the premier flat rides. Then Coaster had a one and a half to two hour wait all day long, and most queue lines have little to no shade. The fair does sell a limited number of rapid passes each day. These are skip the line passes that'll cost roughly $30 per person. They allow you to bypass much of the wait for the major rides once. This will save you a lot of time. If this interests you, I highly recommend buying one in advance online. 
While they do sell them in person, they will often sell out early in the afternoon. I've heard the parking is similarly high crowds during their Fright Nights Halloween event. I haven't personally visited during this time though, so I don't know too much about it and I cannot speak from experience. But if you visit during the main summer season, crowds are much milder. Even on a summer Saturday, the worst queue line I personally saw was a half hour for the most popular rides. The most popular rides are the Wooden Roller Coaster, the Elevator Drop Tower, the Beast Frisbee, the Atmosphere Starflyer, and the Cedar Rapids Log Flume if it's warm outside. And I anticipate the new for 2024 Thunderbolt launch coaster will have a similarly high demand. It's prudent to prioritize these rides early in the day if you get there at opening. From what I've seen, the ride crews work fairly fast to load attractions. The biggest issue is that several rides do not have the highest throughputs. This is especially true when Coaster is running just one train, which it has done quite frequently in recent years. Coaster has also been closed quite a bit over the past few seasons for refurbishments, but the park is usually pretty good about updating the website with its status at least. So definitely check it out if you're coming from a distance. Playland's hours are quite variable depending upon the time of year. They are open late for the fair and fright nights. Then for much of the summer season, Playland is open from the late morning until late afternoon. Then on Fridays and Saturdays, the park often holds a daytime and evening session with separate attendance caps. The separate ticket model helps keep crowds manageable at each session. As I mentioned earlier, Playland feels like a glorified carnival. You don't have much theming nor shade. You just have a lot of rides, primarily flats, placed in close proximity. This does give the Midway a lot of energy, and the newer rides in particular are vibrant paint schemes, and the employees as a whole are friendly. Now let's move on to the ride lineup. For several years, this park's biggest gap has been the lack of a major steel coaster. This will finally be fixed in 2024 with the opening of Thunderbolt. This originally was an intimate hydraulic launch coaster named Senza Fiato at Miragica in Italy, but it was relocated and given a large refurbishment by Zamperla. This included new trains, and an LSM launch. While the layout is fairly short, it crosses over itself a few times and should offer a few nice pops of airtime. The top coaster should still be the unoriginally named coaster. When I experienced this ride in 2019, it had no seatbelts. When you factor in the thin single position lap bar high above my lap and the lack of seat dividers, I was thrown all about the train. As I covered in a separate review, it was one of the scariest coaster experiences I'd ever been on, and it was incredible. The airtime felt like Phoenix on steroids, as many hills threw me a foot into the air. Then the turnarounds had little to no banking, so I was being slammed sideways, sometimes across the whole train. However, it has since gotten seatbelts, so that out of control sensation is likely dampened a bit, but the forces are so strong that it should still be an excellent ride. Then the park is two smaller coasters. One is an SBF Visa spinning coaster named Bug World. It's the standard figure eight model. While the layout is very straightforward, the spinning vehicles add some mild thrills to the experience. Then Kettle Creek Mine Rise, a fun Myler kitty coaster. The first drop has some whip in the back row. Then I like the placement of the rest of the layout. And if you're an adult seeking the credits, yes, you can ride both of these without a kid if you'd so like. Much of this park's lineup is comprised of flat rides, and there are some great ones worth experiencing. My personal favorite is the Beast, a KMG Frisbee. This ride is large in scale, swinging guests 12 stories into the air, but that's not what makes it special. This one offers two different seating options, half the seats face inwards and half face outwards. The inward facing seats offer nice sustained airtime. The outward seats are better and offer a more unhinged ride experience. You still get that airtime, but you feel the forces pushing you outwards against the restraint. It is a freaky feeling. Then everyone gets strong, leg-numbing positive Gs in the downswings. The one con with this ride is a very short cycle, but that's to handle the demand. Atmosphere is the park's tallest ride. Standing 218 feet or 66 meters tall, this is a fun time star flyer that offers incredible views of your surroundings. And you also spin at a decent clip, so you will get a smidge of G's as well. But like Beast, this ride is a painfully short cycle. 
Once you reach the top, you stay there for maybe 3 to 4 seconds before lowering back down. Elevator is an SNS drop tower just a hair shorter than Atmosphere, so it offers similarly great views, and this is a combo tower offering a satisfying ride experience. The launch is decent oomph, and you get fun floater airtime at the top. Then the turbo drop portion, while not super forceful, still induces some airtime at the start. If you want to take these views in at a more leisurely rate, you can also try the West Coast Ferris Wheel. That's available too. Hell's Gate is one of the last Hus top spins in North America, and it has a great start. You get a slow flip load with hang time to start off the ride. Then it follows up with 3 to 4 fast and forceful flips, but the rest of the ride is quite mild and uneventful. If you want spinning rides, this park is a solid selection. The best of the bunch is the relatively new Skybender. This is a Zamperla Griffin. This roundabout has a high top speed, and it's mesmerizing to watch. The bobbing motion did not vary the experience as much as I hoped on ride, but you still get solid G's for much of the ride and it has a long cycle unlike the larger flats. Another one worth pointing out is Enterprise. It runs a fairly basic cycle, but these rides are becoming more and more rare, so I always try to ride one of these when I see them. It is so weird to invert without a true restraint. Then you have some smaller spinning rides that allow you to control the spin, so you can come off quite dizzy if you want to. Kids will find a cluster of rides towards the middle of the park. There are all sorts of roundabouts, plus those aforementioned two coasters. Then as I mentioned earlier, there are some bonus flats brought in for the fair. Nothing that I'd say is a must ride, but they help soak up crowds. Moving on to the dark rides, Playland has some walkthroughs. The best of the bunch is Haunted Mansion. This haunt is an upcharge, but it has solid set pieces. The rooms are fleshed out, and there are some triggered animatronics. Then you have just two to three actors, but there are large gaps in between their appearances, which honestly makes them more effective because you're not expecting them. I know they also offer some additional haunts during Fright Nights, but as I mentioned earlier, I cannot personally speak to how good they are. Then there's also a small mirror maze, and during the fair, they'll typically bring in a fun house or two. The final ride of Nose the Cedar Rapids Log Flume. This is the park's only water ride, but it doesn't really get you all that wet. It also has a fairly weak layout for a log flume, and two drops that are just okay at best. This is on par with your standard traveling log flume. Moving beyond the rides, the park has some bonus attractions like a miniature golf course and a rock climbing wall, but these are additional fees. Then you'll also find the usual mix of midway games. If you're looking for shows, you won't really find those during Playland's main season. Those are offered as part of the fair though. As for food, Playland has a lot of quick service options. It's mostly fried food and sweets, and it's okay in quality. Then if you visit during the fair, the food options are far more extensive. So do I recommend p and &E Playland? Yes I do. The main reason I recommend this park is for the wooden roller coaster. That is an incredible ride. While it may have been neutered somewhat by the seatbelts ever since I rode it, it still should deliver one of the best experiences of any classic coaster. Then there are several wild flat rides here, plus that new for 2024 coaster. While the park does feel very much like a carnival, it does have a fine atmosphere between the busy midway and the beautiful backdrop. So when should you visit? This is a much trickier question, and it comes down to personal tastes and where you're coming from. If your top priority is getting the most rides possible, particularly on coaster, I would try to visit during the summer season with the lighter crowds. If you are interested in more than just rides, you may want to visit during the P&E Fair. There's a reason so many people visit this event. Just know you'll have to wait quite a bit for Playland's most popular rides. If you're planning a coaster road trip to the Pacific Northwest, I almost think you have to visit the P&E Fair. You see, the Washington State Fair is 3 hours south, and they also feature a classic wooden roller coaster, but it has very limited days of operation. You have the Spring Fair in April when Playland is not even open yet for the season, or you have the Fall Fair in September, which overlaps with the p and &E Fair. This is the only option to experience both parks in a single road trip. While talking about trip planning, I also want to highlight the nearby Cypress Mountain. This is a half hour drive from Playland, 
and it is home to the Eagle Coaster. This is an interesting mountain coaster from Sunkid. You take a chairlift up the hill. Then you have over a mile of track going back down. It does have a lot of auto braking, but there are a few turns with some laterals, and there's a quad down with some itty bitty pops of airtime. But the best part about this ride is the setting. I went in June, and it was super foggy, and there was still snow on the ground. So definitely consider packing a jacket even in the summer months because it is cold up there. So those are my thoughts on Peony Playland, both as a park and about the best time to visit. What do you think about this park? Let me know down in the comments. If you enjoyed this review, I would appreciate it if you gave this video a like and you considered subscribing because there will be a lot more roller coaster amusement park videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.